Hey friends, it's Kiss. As you may have noticed, the Ergo feed has been a little quiet. That's because Ergo is deep in post-production on a bunch of really cool projects that'll be coming out over the next few months. And we've needed to just put our energy toward making those, but rest assured, the Ergo you know and love will be coming back soon. In the meantime, we wanted to share something from one of the members of our movement media community. The folks over at Invisible Institute have just released a podcast called You Didn't See Nothing. It's an investigation into the Leonard Clark beating of 1997, told through the eyes, writings, and voice of Johannes LaCour, a writer and thinker from the city. The show is really, really good. We suggest that you subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And in order to kind of give you a taste of the show, we're sharing the first episode today here on Ergo. So make sure you subscribe to You Didn't See Nothing wherever you get your podcasts. And keep an eye out for new Ergo episodes in the very near future. All right, talk to you soon. Hello, Chicago! The night Obama won, I was in a county jail, out in the boonies, waiting to be sentenced. They called me chi town there. If there is anyone out there who still doubts that America is a place where all things are possible, who still wonders... If the so that night, we were drinking hooch, sitting at the tables, and we're watching the TV, moving back and forth to the corner of the room where we got the hooch hidden, gathering around the TV like it's a fire or something, people betting mackerels and betting noodles on whether Obama will win or not. Is he gonna win? No, he ain't gonna win. I think he's gonna win. Back and forth. And once we realized he was in there, it was a party. Getting drunk. Democracy. Talking shit. Opportunity. Partying. And unyielding hope. It was bittersweet. It was more bitter than sweet. Yes, we can. I'm seeing faces I know in that crowd, and I'm feeling like, damn, I'm supposed to be out there. But tonight, I mean, the fact that I'm facing 10 to life while the first black president is getting elected at this defining moment is really fucking me up. Change has come to America. But that night we were celebrating in the hooch work. We partied till it was time to be locked down. Then, we went to our cell. Thank you. God bless you. And may God bless the United States of America. I'm Johannes LaCour. And to tell you the story I'm really here to tell you, we got to press rewind. Back to 1997. The Bulls were reigning champs. Biggie had just been murdered like six months after Tupac. After midnight, and a drive-by shooting occurred. And I was a college student slash weed dealer, living with my dad on the south side of Chicago, selling $10 bags of weed to the homies and going to class on the side. That's when I learned about what happened to a little black boy named Leonard Clark. In Chicago tonight, a group of teenagers is charged with beating a black boy to a pulp and then boasting that they kept their neighborhood white. Leonard Clark is still in a coma. Police say he was attacked by a group of white teenagers who used racial epithets as they beat him unconscious. Leonard was a 13-year-old baby-faced little boy who lived in the projects. He rode his bike across the expressway into this white neighborhood, Bridgeport, in order to put air in his tires. Air cost 25 cents in his neighborhood, but in Bridgeport, the air was free. When Lennar got there, he was attacked by a gang of white guys. They bashed his head into the ground and left him for dead. A disturbing story out of Chicago, the brutal beating of a black teenager. The story made national news. 13-year-old Lennard Clark cannot speak does not react to his mother and is in serious danger of dying. In the vicious act that has gone to the heart of Chicago's deep racial divide. This kind of savage, senseless assault 
strikes at the very heart of America's ideals. Then, almost overnight, the news stories turn to racial reconciliation and forgiveness. This is a podcast about how that happened and how it changed my life. So brace yourself, because this shit is bananas. One witness was murdered. Another key witness is missing. Witnesses are going to disappear. You think he was killed to keep him from testifying? In my heart, I believe that, yeah. Black leaders are going to run out to help white attackers. Repentance uh, begs forgiveness. And it is in that light that I would recommend leniency for him. And the black community is going to become deeply divided. Most people just think that the people are being paid off. I mean, that, that's what the consensus of the community is. Now, let me Catch finish you. answer. Fellow oh, said not, you I'm should be in jail 100 it, years for selling drugs. You're and the only Cliff, hold on a minute. Table. Right. And, and that to be this is You Didn't See Nothing. Say your name and, and spell it one more time. We're recording this time. Uh, my name is Earl Harrington Jr. E A R L. I've been looking back, talking to my friends, trying to understand more about who I was when all this went down. Um, tell me what you remember about me in '97. You're a writer. Always been a writer. Earl and I used to write plays together. The day before Lenara Clark was attacked, we were probably working on our first play, Wolfen. It was about a werewolf who terrorizes the South Side. It was kind of dope because we had two wolves. We had two wolves? Yeah. One came out of one side, one came out of the other side. They just killed everything. You know what I mean? Back then, I was going to class every now and then, running around, dropping off weed and writing. Hey, hey, Sal, how can I get the brothers on the wall here? You want brothers on the wall? Get your own place. You can do what you want to do. Ever since I seen Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing, I knew I wanted to tell stories like that about real black people, real black lives. Rarely do I see any American Italians eating in here. All I see is black folks. So since we spend months in CTA was green and gray. I was rapping a little bit back then, too. And I wasn't bad for real. Had I put as much time into rapping as I had into theater, or especially into selling drugs, I'd probably be a rapper. Well, you know, like every other real hip hop type of guy, you know, like more like militant, more for the people, more black is black. And regardless, light skin, dark skin, whatever, you're going to finally treat us right. That was just your mentality. That's who you were, very militant. Earl's right. At that point, I'd become the guy who says something. Like, when all this happened back in 97, I was going to UIC, the University of Illinois at Chicago. I'd already been to like 75 colleges at this point. Look around you, man. They own this shit. You ever seen Higher Learning? One of the first movies Ice Cube was in. It was dope. It was about some black kids on a white college campus. They on this couch you sitting on, them shoes you got on your feet, this building, this school, this country, you. We behind enemy lines, dog. UIC reminded me of that. I remember it was some sort of huge history class. I'd never been in a class so big. Hundreds of students in a lecture hall. This white kid, another student, he stands up in front of everybody and he's like, if Europeans took over Africa and its resources, then that's just too bad because that's how land is acquired. And if Africans were enslaved and brought to America as slaves, That's just tough luck, because that's how labor is acquired. 
I remember looking around. I remember a woman, a black female student, she looked at me and I just felt her look. Halfway like, can you believe this shit? And the other half like, are you gonna say something? Because that's who I become on that campus. The guy who says something. So I stand up and I'm like, <clears throat> well, if I follow you to your car and I put you in your trunk and take your car, is it just too bad? Because that's how transportation is acquired. After class, I followed him to his car. And I didn't do anything, but I got tears in my eyes. I'm so angry and I'm just like, you see how easy it could be? Anyway, that was the last day I was in anybody's college. Okay, um, uh, tell me your name and, and, spell, and spell your name. Sure, Kanisha Broadwater, K-A-N-E-S-H-A. I met Kanisha while I was still at UIC. We were both involved in this black student union organization called The Foundation. Who would you say I was? Like, any, you got any memories that, that, that might speak to? Who you were then? <laughs> <laughs> Let me pause. This. Okay. Okay, so uh, after further review, uh, <laughs> uh, we've decided that there's no other way for her to tell of how she know me than to tell how she know me. <laughs> So, um, so when we met, you were like, I think you were asking me my name or something. I don't really remember. And I was like, well, why? You're like, well, I'm trying to wake up with you. And I was like, yeah, that, that about that about does it. <laughs> um, okay, so that ain't all I was, though. No, that, of course not all you were, but I'm just saying that's definitely one side of you. But I definitely also think you're one of the smartest people that I know, so... I remember Kanisha was a little surprised when she found out I wasn't just a student. If you're thinking the 90s and what your average drug dealer is portrayed, it's rarely a story about someone who is not only street smart, but book smart. So when we met and I got to know that all of these things comprised you, I was like, oh, well, I didn't really know that was a thing that could happen. It was an interesting dichotomy. From as early as I can remember, I've always had a foot in a couple different worlds. I grew up in Chicago, a neighborhood called Hyde Park. It's in the middle of the South Side, but it's different. Almost like a suburb in the inner city like gang-banging meets Ivy League-ish academia. It's something else. Both of my grandfathers were lawyers during Jim Crow. Several of my uncles were Black Panthers at one time or another. My mom kept our walls full of African art, bookshelves full of Black authors. She insisted I had an African name. Johans, gift from God. She made me read Native Son when I was 11. So being ride or die for black folks has been in me for as long as I can remember. In Chicago tonight, the brutal beating of a black teenager allegedly by a gang of whites. Could... Yeah, so I believe that I probably heard about it on the news. My friend Rasan, we call him Ro is the one who told me about what happened to the little boy, Lennar Clark. Yeah, that, I think that was probably, you know, one of my very first thoughts was to, you know, reach out. It was somewhere around noon when the phone rang. I definitely want to say it was a Saturday. I often drank through the wee hours of the night back then, so it probably woke me up. Rose like a brother. I mean, you know, as an only child, your best friends become like your siblings. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I knew we felt the same way about this type of shit. So I heard that a child had gotten attacked in Bridgeport. It was a no-brainer that it seemed to be a racial attack. 
it was a no-brainer because of the neighborhood where it took place, Bridgeport. It's always been tough territory. The neighborhood of Chicago's vast slaughterhouses scored by the Chicago River, roadways, elevated tracks and railroad lines. That was NPR, but this my little homie Pee Wee. It's where you you can get spit on and called a nigga, <laughs> and, and that's where our mayor is from, both of them. Pee Wee's talking about the Dailies. Mayor Daly and his son, Mayor Daly. Ah, come on, that's baloney. I said that was baloney, but I said something else, which I'm not going to say. I said, oh, you know, it's bullshit. The Dailies ran Chicago for 60 years. When you hear people talk about Chicago's political machine, that's them. There'll be law and order in Chicago as long as I'm mayor. They from Bridgeport, a neighborhood with deep ties to police and the mob. And Bridgeport has always been white. Bridgeport is one Chicago neighborhood that time missed. A working class bungalow belt that used its political clout to isolate itself from the growing black population. An island of blue collar ethnic whites with a history of racial strife. Bridgeport had Chicago's first race riot in 1919. When he was just a teenager, old man Daly was part of an Irish gang that fanned the flames of those riots. I suppose so. We were taught how to use our fists when we were young. You had to do that. And later, when he was mayor, he did everything he could to make Chicago among the most racially segregated cities in the United States, including building an expressway, a border wall, like 10 lanes deep between the white people in Bridgeport and what we called the low end, which was all black. And on the black side were these housing projects, High rises, Stateway, the Robert Taylors, the Ida B's, the Ickies, the Hilliard Homes, the Dearborns. Most of those high rises are destroyed now. But in the late 90s, they were four miles of vertical ghetto right next to the expressway. In the shadow of Chicago's majestic skyline, isolated islands of crime, poverty, 11 of the nation's poorest... One project alone was 28 buildings, 16 stories each. The longest stretch of public housing in the whole country. White people didn't set foot on the black side of the highway. And all I knew about the white side, Bridgeport, is you don't go there. Who told me? Everybody. It was like... The Loch Ness Monster. It was like the Bermuda Triangle going up. It was like, you go in Bridgeport, you might not come out. And Roe knew firsthand. As a child, I had gone to elementary school in Bridgeport. I was bused into a magnet school, and so I had had some experience with some of the hostilities that Bridgeport could offer to a young black child. And here it is, a cat born the same year I'm born, having the same experiences that I associate with my grandparents' generation. Brickstone at our bus. Folks tried to stop the bus to, you know, get on. Uh, but yeah, we were threatened, nigga this, nigga that, uh, go back to Africa, all that type of stuff. So when Rose saw what happened to this kid on the news, it hit home for him. Yeah, definitely struck a chord based on my own experience. And I think I wanted to do something. It's like, man, let me call Johans. Let me call Johans. He'll understand. The same way I'd rally troops if one of the guys got attacked, I was rallying the troops to avenge this kid's beating. Fuck that shit. We gotta, you know, we gotta get as many people as we can. What's a proper response to something like this that's happening in our city? I couldn't think of anything other than like, we gotta go over there. You know, sometimes you gotta go to war to get peace. I hung up the phone with Ro and called Pee Wee. Pee Wee has been a baby face boy since he was a baby. He's like every South Side neighborhood's little brother. And I ain't gonna lie, I never want to go at Bridgeport. Uh, listen, you ain't gonna have me hanging from a tree. You know what I mean? Hanging from a tree. That's the image we associated with Bridgeport. But Pee Wee still rode out with us. I called Jamez. Jamez was just a real smooth dude, but he was a gangster. And he was a weed head, 
I mean, we all were, but he stayed high. He was ready to go. He bout that action. He died some years ago, though, from MS. May he rest in peace. I called Will. Will is like Blade, the black vampire superhero. He wears sunglasses at night. I mean, who does that? Um, my son was about five years old at that time. And it was just a sense of, could that ever happen to him, you know? I called Little Man. Little Man was the one I thought would be most ready. But he was like, that ain't your cousin. And little Man didn't ride. Last but not least, I called Earl, the guy I wrote plays with. And y'all called me, like basically the revolution is here. For whatever reason, we rode in Jamez's car, his little ass two-door Sebring. I mean, we were deep, loaded in like sardines. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember us being packed in. We obviously smaller at that time, so. Just riding, it was daylight. I don't even know why we went in just broad daylight, but this is what we doing. We were definitely going to outnumber somebody, somebody closer to our age and make them feel what that little boy felt. We were really salty, we were hyped up. It was completely emotional. Relatively quiet. You know, the quiet before the storm, it was almost like one of those lives. Bridgeport is nicer than the ghetto, but it's still super blue collar. The first thing you see is Sox Park and the fact that they ain't missing no city services. I do remember that we did have some bottles and pipes and, you know, we was ready for that action. <laughs> it's not sweet like that in Chicago to beat the shit out of little black boys simply because they're black. Like, no, 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 they can't just do that. You know what I'm saying? That's what y'all doing? Y'all over here putting black people into comas, huh? So shit, put us in one too. With Michael Jordan and Bugs Bunny, it's Space Jam. Friends and ladies, diamond rings, bridal. Until 1998. All you've got to do is... the negative and make a positive out of it. Trying not to... Inside the Horizon restaurant on Halstead, we were called over by white diners who preferred not to be identified but wanted to speak up in defense of their neighborhood. Why are they making such a big stink about this anyhow? I mean, every time it's on the news, they have to mention the Bridgeport. Is that necessary? Is that necessary? I'm not, I'm not a racist, but why can't they be called a racist as well as we are well, in their feelings? Are you recording this? Mm -hmm. Holy God. Well, you said come on over and talk. Well, we sure, why not? So I'm that. talking, yeah. but I get, I get riled up. One incident doesn't make everybody a racist. Thank you. There's been rather more than one incident over I the past care. 20 years. So is, there's been more than one in their area, too. Why don't they take care of their own? Just because you're white, I guess you don't belong. I mean, we're getting to be a minority. I don't want to be prejudiced. I like black people. I've known a lot of, I mean, black people. I haven't had everything in my lifetime. I had to work for it. And that's what I resent. I don't resent the black man. I resent their attitude as a black man. We saw some guys that kind of fit the description, you know, fit as being our counterparts. Two or three white dudes who looked about our age. I think we rolled around maybe once or twice after we spotted them. And then we parked. And I think we might even pop the trunk. And oh, oh shit. shit. I remember being sorely, severely outnumbered. It was about to be the whole opposite situation <laughs> that I had in mind coming over here. They were coming out from like this big field house building in the park just swarming. It looked like a football team running onto the field, but in regular street clothes. This is not what's up. 
you know, white teens, early 20s. They had bats and pipes. You know, these little poles and stuff we got in this, this is not gonna get it done. And we was realizing like, nah, this ain't it. It's time to regroup. It's time to retreat. So we got in the car and we left. I remember feeling not defeated, but disappointed. Like, damn. But also finding or trying to find solace in like, God damn it, I got a few good men. Yeah, I, that's definitely a that's definitely a feeling that I had too. What was, you know, I felt like it was the first time where, you know, I was prepared to go to battle for somebody I had never met. I, I didn't necessarily feel like it was the right way, but I felt the heart was in the right place. Even though like we tried to make ourselves feel better, I still felt a little disappointed. I still felt a little defeated in a certain kind of way. But also we was hungry. Once we got out of there, we was, you know, kind of heated. And then we went to Pepe's, Pepe's taco spot. The reason I remember it because I like that little spicy carrots. And we just sitting around the round table talking about, yeah, well, we might have to go back over there and check some motherfuckers out. And then dude just happened to say, Bridgeport? I'm from Bridgeport. Everybody head turned like, what? Will walked over and locked the door. <laughs> that, that was the real part. <laughs> Ain't nobody leaving. I was like, uh-oh, well, here we go. Are you are you all from Bridgeport? Like, yeah. Well, he didn't enjoy his lunch. I mean, he got every taco or every salsa sauce thrown up against him till the lady at the front door, like, just let him out. The lady at the counter. I was, was like, but it was all human. I told Will to leave the guy be. That poor dude had clearly bitten off more than he could chew. And I think deep down, Will knew this ain't who we were looking for. Like, the dude just was like, I love that area. You know? None of us were smiling at the time, but we can laugh at this shit now. No, 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 the funniest part about that whole situation is the way we walked out that place. Anybody else from here from Bridgeport? Everybody shook their head like, no. <laughs> yeah, it was hilarious. Like Tom and Jerry, that doink, 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 doink. We just walked out like, yeah. Whatever little high we got from fucking up dude's lunch wore off pretty quick for us all. Lenar Clark was still laid up in the hospital, fighting for his life. This morning, a 13-year-old boy is in a coma after a brutal beating in Chicago. Authorities are calling That night, Lenar was all over the news. His mom was being interviewed by reporters. I've been praying and talking to him in his ear, letting him know that mom is here. And while his mom sat by his hospital bed, three white dudes were arrested. 19-year-old Michael Kwidzinski, 18-year-old Frank Caruso, and 17-year-old Victor Jassis are charged with attempted murder. The white boys was released on bond over the next couple of days. That infuriates the victim's family. He's upstairs fighting for his freedom and his life. To me out free. Meanwhile, the families of the accused were lawyering up. Under the circumstances, they had to charge somebody, and these people, these boys are from the neighborhood, and, and they kind of uh, caught the wrath. My client did not do this, and he's not responsible for this. My client is innocent. In the next few days, in the newspapers, we saw pictures of Lennar in a coma, laid up in that hospital bed with tubes coming out of his nose, raw skin from where his head had been stomped and scraped against concrete, hooked up to breathing machines. They fucked him up bad. He had what we call a pumpkin head because that's how the swelling and all the lumps makes your face look. I'd never seen one on someone so young. This image of this little child's face, disfigured and deformed from the hands of white men, it reminded me of Emmett Till. Here this little boy was, fighting for life itself, fighting not to go out like Emmett. Mm -hmm. 
Growing up, I'd always had an internal kind of struggle between the peaceful Martin Luther King approach or that eye for an eye Malcolm X route. Being young and from Chicago, I leaned into fighting fire with fire, meeting violence with violence. In this case, Malcolm X wasn't working, but I knew I had to do something. I'm closing in on 50 years old, and I still see a lot of the world through the lens of this story. And after 10 years in the joint, I'm figuring out who I am, how I got here, and where I'm going. So I want to take you back in time. We're going to talk to people who are central to the Lenar Clark story and to my life. We're going to talk about race and poverty, police and the press, politics and gangsterism, and how they all came together at this one moment in Chicago history. The beating changed Lenar's life, but it was everything that happened afterwards that changed mine. You Didn't See Nothing is a production of the Invisible Institute and USG Audio. This podcast is written and reported by yours truly, Johannes LaCour, with Bill Healy, Dana Brozost Kelleher, Erissa Apantaku, and Sarah Geis. Sound design, mixing, and music supervision by Steven Jackson and Phil Dumahusky at the Audio Non-Visual Company. Original music by Taka Yasuzawa. Our executive producers are Allison Flowers and Jamie Calvin for the Invisible Institute and Josh Block for USG Audio. Production support by Jennifer Sears. Fact checking by Angeli Mercado. Our key art is by Kenneth L. Copeland Jr. Special thanks to Michael Clark. Archival audio used in this episode is from C-SPAN, CBS Evening News, NPR, MSNBC, NBC News, WBEZ, Dateline, CNN, WTTW, Universal Pictures, Columbia Pictures, YouTube, CBS Chicago, The Today Show, WMAQ, and CONUS. For more information, go to our show notes or visit our website, usgaudio.com.